Let's pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you for graciously receiving us into your house of worship. Thank you for allowing us to call you Father, to pray to you, and worship you this morning. This is a house of prayer, and it is also the house where we hear your word taught and explained to us. So we pray, Lord, that we may truly turn our eyes upon Jesus, and that our knee bows and our tongues confess to the glory of God the Father that Jesus Christ is the Lord. We want to see you, Jesus. That's why we ask that through your Holy Spirit, you guide our hearts this morning as we read your word. And we ask that what we do not know, you teach us. That what we do not have, you give us. And that what we are not yet, you may make us for the glory of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. It is truly a joy to be with you this morning for this uh, worship service, to see your faces. I remember some of you because in years past I had the privilege of uh, meeting you, but also to be able to hear you sing and worship together the name of our God. And let me say it's great to hear the congregation singing. Many churches have a worship team singing and the loudspeakers amplify their voices. But the greatest feeling is when God's people sing and they do it with all their heart. And they don't save their voices for later. We give it all now because we don't know how much time we have again to sing. So whenever we worship God, we do it wholeheartedly with our whole voice and may God receive our praise and worship this morning. Amen. It was such a joy years and years ago to get some of these young men from the town of Hunedoara where I was born and raised and baptized and uh, the church I began to minister in and get these young men together in our three-bedroom apartment and uh, have them in our living room for cookies and uh, soft drinks and uh, also for reading and learning God's Word. As Andre said before, our children were young, were five or six years of age at the time. Our two first sons, our third one was born later. And they enjoyed coming to the living room and see the young men from the church and kind of feeling important that these young men are here with us and they children would be with them and spend some time. And uh, I was praying that God would work in their hearts just as he did in mine years and years back that some of them might desire to serve the Lord full-time in ministry. And sure enough, to my great joy, some of them told me that they decided to go to seminary. It was um, great rejoicing in my heart when Andre gave his life to the Lord. And then later on, when he graduated high school, he told me that he wanted to go to seminary. After he graduated seminary, I was happy to hear that he had the opportunity to come to North America to continue his biblical studies, just as I did about 10 years before that, in 1990, when uh, the Lord gave me the opportunity to go to Prairie Bible College. Uh, not a big school near Calgary in Canada, but a school that really believed in the inspiration and authority of God's Word. And uh, I was grounded in the Scriptures, and I came to love God's Word and God's people even more than I did before. So I was so thankful for the time I spent in Canada. I returned to Romania in 1995. I got married to Nelly. You saw her in the picture. She's here with us this morning. I don't know exactly where. <laughs> oh, there. She's waving her hand from way back there. Uh, and our first son was born here in America. Why? Because as soon as we got married, we came to Master's Mission in North Carolina. A place, uh, one year training for people who intend to go missionary, especially in remote area places. So they teach men how to farm the land, how to fix mechanical things, how to build homes, roads, uh, water systems, and they teach ladies how to do home gardening and different kinds of uh, health things and uh, um, just uh, be a good homemaker and a uh, help and resource to, to the community. So during the year and a half we spent there, our first son was born, Sammy, 
and uh, we returned home with him, and we've been serving with the Master's Mission in Romania since 99. Uh, this morning, I'm so happy to say we were so glad to get on that plane, and after years of uh, all kinds of uh, mandates and restrictions, finally be able to come back and visit North America. Years ago, I had visited your church, and it was at a time uh, when I, for the first time, met your pastor, Chuck, and uh, he had come back home because he had a cute appy, as he called it. Cute what? Well, it was an appendicitis crisis, and the doctor said you had a cute appendicitis. And he came back from holiday to be home, and that's when I met him, or I wouldn't have met him at that time. So I do believe in divine appointments. And uh, even if they come through some physical pain, <laughs> uh, I was so thankful that God gave Andre, a senior pastor, that helped him along and uh, took him under his wings and really delegated authority to him as a young starting pastor. It was a privilege I did not have when I started ministry. And I know that Andre is flourishing and uh, uh, really having an impact in the lives of many because he also had a pastor who uh, really taught him and was along him and were just brother and brother, shoulder to shoulder in God's ministry. So now we came to America very excited. It's, it was last year, our 25th wedding anniversary, and we thought, this is going to be great. We're going to visit people we love, churches that we know. Uh, it's going to be so good to spend three weeks in, in America. N Nelly hasn't been back here for 17 years. And we landed in Knoxville, Tennessee, only to find out that our checked luggage was somewhere lost in Europe. So we said, well, that's a start. But I guess we'll do what all good missionaries do. We go to Walmart and buy whatever we need. <laughs> So the things that were in the bags, we had to go to Walmart and buy whatever we needed for the next couple days, we thought. Well, it was not to be a couple days. It was four days before finally our luggage made it to America. Days in which instead of spending time with people and enjoying their company and doing just relaxing things, I was on the phone all the time, tracking our bags, talking to the people at the airport, finding out why our bags did not make it yet. One of them got there the second day, but the second one did not make it for four days, and they didn't deliver the bags until it was, both of them were there. I also bought a phone, because while I'm in the States, I need to talk to people and schedule my appointments and be on the road, and I need the GPS. So I bought a phone, and I bought a SIM card and a subscription plan for one month, and those things were not working. I spent hours and hours with different service people and getting online and talking to people who don't know English and they were trying to counsel me how to, how to get things done and literally hours and hours and the phone was just not working. So four days later when we started our trip and we went down to Florida, we went on the road from Walmart to Walmart where we had Wi-Fi to get more indications and to, to get closer and closer to what, where we were going. And uh, just as things couldn't get any worse, when I was getting ready to go to church and have a presentation with a ministry in Romania with family pictures and all the things that we do, my trusted laptop lost communication with my phone. And every day for radio, I record things on the phone and transfer them to the laptop. And I thought this was going to be a breeze, and it was not. And I couldn't get things on the laptop, so I went to church frustrated because our bags didn't arrive, that our phone was not working, and the files were not getting shared. And I was like, God, what's happening? This was supposed to be a good, a nice trip, a relaxing trip. And things are just not going according to plan. But the fourth day came. It's not the third day according to scriptures, it's the fourth day for us. But the fourth day came and we got our bags and the phone finally started working and I was able to get the files into the laptop and things were nice ever since. But not all stories have a happy ending. I remember years ago a dear family from Romania who had moved to the States and God had gifted them greatly in musical field and they uh, arranged four-part harmonies and orchestration for hymns and choir songs. And many choir directors, including the church choir in the town where I live and where Andre was baptized, we used those arrangements uh, to God's glory and to great benefit to us as 
uh, singers. They came to Romania to meet with choir directors, to meet with churches, and to share certain things from their testimony and their experience in serving God through music. Their last meeting in Romania was supposed to be in a large Baptist church near Timisoara, and uh, it was going to be their last meeting before going to the States. Well, things didn't go that way. They missed an exit of the freeway, and because they were running late and didn't want to be late for the church service, uh, the husband decided to turn around and get back to the exit and then get to the church on time. But he forgot to check both sides, and as he turned in the middle of the road, a big truck hit them from the side, and they were both killed instantly. So the church service that evening started to everyone's shock with the announcement that the dear couple they were expecting to worship with that night had gone to be with the Lord. So when tragedy strikes, we ask, why? Why do such, such things happen? Lord, why me? Why now? What is going on? God, are you still loving are you still good? Are you still powerful? Are you still in control? Maybe some things just get out of control, even of God's control. What do you do and what do I do when we deal with life's frustrations, with life's tragedies, with difficulties and trials and suffering? Well, there is a passage in Scripture that I think will have a great and comforting answer for us this morning. It is in the Gospel of John, chapter 9, verse one through 12. And the author says the following things. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Jesus answered, It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me, as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and applied the clay to his eyes and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went away and washed and came back seeing Therefore the neighbors and those who previously saw him as a beggar were saying, Is not this the one who used to sit and beg? Others were saying, This is he. Still others were saying, No, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the one. So they were saying to him, How then were your eyes opened? He answered, The man who is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went away and washed and I received sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. Try to imagine this young Jewish couple who decide to get married. They finally have their wedding day, the ceremony, everybody's happy about them. And a little later, the wife informs the husband, you will become a daddy. So they're both rejoicing that the Lord is going to bless their marriage with a child. And great was their joy when they found out that their firstborn was going to be a boy. In Jewish culture, it was very important that you have a son, so that the family name and property and inheritance would go on through the son. And they said, hey, we dealt with this. Our first child is a son, so things are great. And everybody came and rejoiced rejoiced with them and, and they were so happy and thanking God for his blessings only to find out a few weeks probably maybe a couple months later that their newly born son could not see they probably spent their time and energy and money trying to get treatments trying to deal with the problem and they realized that this boy that was born blind he was going to be a blind man for life. And the only thing that he could do in that situation was to sit and beg. There was no way for him to earn a living. He couldn't have a social life. He probably couldn't marry and have a family. And certainly he could not go to the temple to worship because the law of God said whoever has a particular disabilitating disease is not allowed to go into the temple. So... The passage we read this morning 
takes us back to the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem. The happiest feast of the year. Both the Bible and the historians confirm that this was the greatest joy in the feast that the Lord commanded His people to keep. It was after they gathered all their fruit and produce of the land, and they were commanded by God to come and live in booths near Jerusalem for seven days and keep rejoicing before the Lord for His providence and grace and mercy to them. Well, there was one guy who was not rejoicing because he was blind, sitting there and begging. Everybody knew him as the beggar near the temple. As people came to worship the Lord, they were commanded not to come empty-handed. So besides the uh, tithing that they brought to the temple, they also had alms to give. And what better place for a blind man to sit than where people come and give their alms. This time, the disciples have a question. Their dilemma is honest and sincere. They ask Jesus. It's, the blind man says nothing. He's just waiting there to be helped, to, to get some alms. But the disciples say, Rabbi, which means teacher, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Remember that oftentimes the teachers of the law and the Pharisees came to Jesus with trick questions, trying to uh, get him in the corner, trying to get him to say certain things that they could accuse him of later on. Now, this is not one of those situations. These are the disciples of Jesus. And they ask a sincere and honest question. What is the cause of this great tragedy, of this great suffering? It's a question that you and I often have in life. And it's sincere and honest before God. Lord, what is causing this in my life? Why all these frustrations? Why the loss of a job? Why the medical, the doctor's verdict? Why this illness? Why the loss of dear ones? Why children who are born with disabilities? Why, why? Why now, why me? And it's honest questions and we can ask them before the Lord because He's willing to engage us in answering those questions. So they ask the Lord, they have this dilemma, who sinned? Because the law said that whoever sins will pay for it. God said, if you don't keep my commandments, there will be dire consequences. They also had the examples in the Old Testament of people who disobeyed God and were punished for their disobedience. Think of the rebellion of Korah, Daitam, and Abihu, who said, well, God is not only speaking through Moses. We can also be the mouthpieces of God. And they wanted to uh, bring incense and preach to the people and teach the people of God. And God said, stay away from them. And the earth opened up and swallowed them all, not just the three who led the rebellion, but their families and their little ones. So yes, the sins of the parents can be visited upon their children. And in Exodus chapter 34, when Yahweh introduces himself to Moses, he says, yes, I'm abounding in loving kindness, full of grace and mercy to thousands of generations, but I will not let the evil go unpunished. And I visit the sins of the parents unto the third and fourth generation to their children. So the teachers of the law were right that maybe the physical illness and difficulty was the result of the sin of the parents. Or it could be the result of the sins of this man. But how could he sin if he was born blind? And they said, a person can sin even before being born while in the mother's womb. Well, at least they acknowledged that life begins at conception, not at birth. So that whatever is forming into the mother's womb is already a human being. And the Pharisees said, well, even before being born that human being can sin. Psalm 51 says that we are conceived in sin. And the Bible is clear that all men are sinners. We're born sinners and we commit sin. So it could be that this boy, this baby, was born blind because of some sin that he might have committed in the mother's womb. The disciples wanted to know. They had this dilemma. Master, teacher, rabbi, tell us. Give us an answer. Maybe as we think of the Old Testament and the punishments that God brought for sin, we would say, well, yeah, but that was the law. Now we have the grace. So things are not as rough in the New Testament as in the Old Testament. 
God is a God of bloodshed, of justice in the Old Testament, but He's a God of love and mercy and grace in the New Testament. Well, tell that to Ananias and Sapphira. Because they lied to Peter and to the Holy Spirit about the price with which they sold the property, and they both died because of their lie. Or tell that to other people who stood against the Apostle Paul and, and the, the disciples of Christ. And even when Paul writes to, to the Corinthians, he says, because of disregard to the Lord's table, many among you are suffering, and even premature physical death. So we have the same God of love and justice in the Old Testament as the God of love and justice in the New Testament. Disciples ask Jesus, what's the cause of this problem? And Jesus makes it clear that this particular disease is not as a result of sin. It is neither that this man sinned nor his parents. Oh, so we found the only three sinless persons in the whole history of the world. The two parents and this guy. They never sinned. But that's not what Jesus says. He doesn't say they never sinned. He says it is not because of the parents' sin. And it is not because of this man's sin that things are this way. But, but then why? What, what's, what's your answer? It is so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As we struggle with life's questions and difficult situations, we might do well to remember this verse. Everything happens with a purpose. And God has a purpose in even the sufferings and the bad things that happen to us in life because He wants His works to be displayed in us. Sometimes those works might be miraculous in healing and dealing with the circumstances and getting us through victorious and everybody is happy. Or the Lord would give us the grace to go through the trial and the tribulation without removing the circumstances that are causing our difficulties, but saying, my grace is sufficient to you. Well, Jesus is the one saying, this situation is for the glory of God. The works of God have to be displayed in this man. We might do well to remember that. Yahweh tells Moses, I am the God full of loving kindness, but I also punish the sins of the parents and of the children. All the heroes of the Bible that we read of, they were sinners too, just like you and me. Whether it's David or it's Samuel, or it's Joseph, or one of the prophets, they all sinned. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. However, there was one person in the whole history of the world who never sinned. Not a sin in his life. He was not born with a sin nature because he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And never in his life, although he was tempted like us in every way, he never sinned nor any bad word was found on his lips, on his mouth, nor any evil thought crossed his mind. That was Jesus, the Son of God. So, did he suffer? Of course he did. He suffered more than you and I will ever suffer. Isaiah 53 says that although he was righteous, God decided to crush him through suffering. But why? He was the only one who never deserved to suffer and to die. It's because God placed upon Himself, upon Jesus, the sufferings and the sins of us all. So He suffered without deserving it, so that you and I might be spared the judgment of God. And whatever we may suffer on this earth, He had already suffered it before. So we can be with Him and we can have Him as our comforter and as our example. Will Jesus just stop at explaining the situation? I think that's what the disciples were expecting. Some answer from God through Jesus that would clarify the situation. So that's what Jesus said. But what would Jesus do? Remember the time when that question was on everybody's lips, on bumper stickers, on bracelets, on Christian advertising, WWJD, what would Jesus do? And I don't question the motivation of those who started that movement. But to my understanding of the scripture, 
we never really know exactly what would Jesus do in a certain situation. The disciples spent three and a half years of their life listening to Jesus, eating with Jesus, traveling with Jesus, having him explain things to them and, and doing miracles before them. And every time they were surprised by what Jesus did or said. Even in this situation, they never expected that answer from Jesus, nor what he was going to do next. So the thing is, the, question, the most important question is not, what would Jesus do? The most important question is, what did Jesus do? Read the Bible. Get to know Jesus. The Jesus from the Bible, not from the traditions of elders. The Jesus that the Word of God describes. And as we get to know Jesus... The Lord works in our lives the image of Christ through sufferings, through joys, through accomplishments, through disappointments. We get to know Jesus from the Word of God and then we try to be like Him. So Jesus does not stop at just explaining, though His answer was great and it's a great comfort for anyone who deals with life's struggles and situations. The works of God have to be displayed in us. But Jesus goes on a step further, and he starts talking to the man. He spat on the ground, made clay of the spittle, and applied the clay to his eyes, and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam. Jesus helped a lot of people. Not everyone who came to Jesus was helped by him, because uh, some crowds were just listening there and just being participant in, in what he did. But some people came and asked for help, and Jesus helped them. Sometimes he was not even there. I mean, he helped someone who was in a different town. Other times, Jesus just said a word and the situation was resolved. And some other times, particularly when people suffered from debilitating diseases, which prevented them from going to worship and being in the temple, Jesus touched them. So Jesus touches this blind man so that he receives his sight. But this is not the only blind man that people that, that Jesus helped. Uh, the New Testament tells us that Jesus healed several blind men. He spoke to Bartimaeus in Luke chapter 18. He touched the eyes of two blind men in Matthew chapter 20. He put spit on the eyes of another blind man in Mark 8, which is pretty close to what happens here. But this time, the Lord is employing another method of healing. So don't ever fall in love with the methods. People always say, well, that works there. Oh, those people do that. So let's do this. God is never a slave to a method. And we shouldn't be either. We should be enthralled and in love with the one working, not with the methods. What works in one place might not work in another. One blind man would say, he has to speak to you. Another one would say, no, he has to touch you. And this one would say, no, he has to make mud and put it on your eyes. No, it's Jesus. It's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Just get to know Him and look, turn your eyes upon Jesus. And He will set you free. So, why does Jesus spit on the ground and make mud and apply it to the eyes of the blind man? The chapter says that it was a Sabbath day. Like many of Jesus' miracles, this one happens on a day when the teachers of the law and the Pharisees said, you should do nothing, absolutely nothing, just worship. And some of the controversies of Jesus' teaching and miracles spark directly from this teaching of the elders that he shouldn't do anything in the Sabbath day. So the Pharisees said, you know, if <clears throat> you feel something on the Sabbath day that you need to spit, you're allowed to spit. But once you spit, don't you dare go and scratch it on the ground like that, because that means you're plowing. You're improving the quality of the ground. You're preparing to do something. So no plowing on the Sabbath day, okay? And when Jesus does this, the Pharisees are enraged, because he's working on the Sabbath day, not only to heal the blind man, but also plowing the ground. So Jesus does that, and he applies it to his eyes. and says, go wash yourself. And he comes back seeing clearly. He sees so well that people look at him and say, he's not the same man. Look at that. Isn't he the one who used to sit and beg? He says, yeah, yeah, it is me. No, 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 it's not you. It just looks like you. No, 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 it is me. No, 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 we'll ask your parents. 
So they go and ask his parents, is this your son? Yup, he's our son. Nah, I guess he just looks like him. But no, he says, it is me. And he was right. If you took a DNA sample, it was him. He could prove he's the same man. And yet, he was not the same. He was not the same. As he was going to tell the Pharisees and the, and the leaders of the people, I was blind and now I see. They said, you're in sin. You know nothing. This man cannot be from God because he breaks Sabbath. He says, I don't know where he comes from, but I know one thing. I was blind and now I see. You can take that away from me. So when you become a new believer and you love Christ, you don't know much about him, but whatever you know makes you love him and desire to know him more and to be more and more like him. Go tell others, I was blind, but now I see. In one of the churches I pastor in Romania, there was this guy who used to wear very thick glasses. He was in his early 60s. Whenever he would read from the Bible, he'd have to bring it right here to his nose uh, to read the verses in the church. And uh, when he walked on the street, he had to walk slowly so as not to stumble. One day he decided to go and have laser surgery on his eyes. The surgery was successful. Two weeks later when he came to church, I looked at him. And just like the crowd here, I said, wow, is that really you, Brother Titus? He says, yes, it is me. We didn't take any DNA test. I knew it was him. But I said, you know, this surgery took 20 years, made you look 20 years younger than before. Because his facial muscles re relaxed. And now he was his normal self, not squinting to see. And, and he said, I feel 20 years younger. I see well. I, I wear normal glasses now, just, just like anyone who wears glasses. And I can walk on the street. And I, That's great. But you know... I didn't see that change just on the face of someone who had eye surgery. I saw that look on faces of people who had heart surgery. Not open heart surgery, but the surgery by the Holy Spirit. When God searched their hearts and they realized that they should give their life over to the Lord, their countenance changed. And I saw them on the hallways of the church and they were coming toward me and I knew exactly what they were going to tell me. Their face told the story. Their, the look in their eyes. And they say, Pastor, I gave my life to the Lord today. I'm a believer now. I want to be baptized. So I said, I knew it. I knew before you told me. I saw it in, on your face and in your eyes. When God enters our lives, He changes not only the internal man, the inner man, who was dead and now is alive. He changes the countenance of His people. And... Your face should be radiant of God's glory. And Jesus should be read on our faces and on our mouths and in our eyes. Because now we are His people. And this guy, he says, it is me. And yes, it is him, but it is not him. Because he was blind and now he sees. He was dead and now he's alive. Whatever was dead inside of him before meeting Jesus, now he's alive. He has a testimony. He's ready to pay the price. And if the Pharisees are going to put him out of the synagogue for that, so be it. And he says, I know one thing. This Jesus, he must be from God because he gave me the sight. You know, messianic passages in the Old Testament said that when the Messiah will come, the blind will receive their sight. The lame will walk and the poor will hear the gospel preached to them. That's the answer Jesus gave to John the Baptist when he said, Are you the Messiah or should we wait for another? And Jesus says, Well, this is what's happening. So everybody knew that if the blind start receiving their sight and the lame walk and to the poor, the gospel of the kingdom is preached. The Messiah is here. And Jesus meets the man later in the temple and says, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he says, Well, who is the Son of Man that I should believe in him? It is the one talking to you. And John says, he believed and worshipped Jesus. Of all the things that John could have written about Jesus, he selected some because he says, you can't tell all the stories and all, all the messages and the miracles that Jesus made. But I've selected these, he says, I've selected these so that you may believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And by believing in him, that you may have eternal life in his name. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe that he is your Lord, Savior, and Master? Are you worshiping him with all your heart and all your life and all your strength and all your mind? When bad things happen to us, when our luggage gets lost, when our phones don't work, 
when the doctor says we might only live a few more months, when accidents strike and we're wondering, God, why? Why now? Why is this happening? Remember this, it is for the works of God to be displayed in you and me. Whether God will work in a miraculous way, like in this man's life, giving him sight, or maybe God will give us the grace to keep going through those circumstances, we need to trust that God is in control, that He is good, that He is loving, and that He gave His Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer for you and me. Not only that He would take our physical illnesses upon Him, but that He would take our sin and take it away forever and give us the way to God and to eternal security in His hands. So what do we do when we get a bad deal in life, humanly speaking? What do we do when we suffer? What do we do where when we're in a furnace, we trust the Lord. We turn our eyes upon Jesus. We know that He makes everything for a purpose and that His purpose is good and perfect. And as we trust Him and as we work with Him, we don't always understand how He works and what His motivations are, but we know He loves us and we know we can trust Him to the end. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father God, we thank you that you love us so much. You have declared it in your word and you have demonstrated it by sending your son to die for our sins. We thank you that we're safe in your arms and whatever you might allow to come in our lives, it is for your good and perfect will to be accomplished. May we be worthy servants of you. May we be good stewards of everything you, you entrusted to us. May we trust you, Lord, with our lives, with our goods, with our families, with everything, that you're our great God and good shepherd. And may we glorify you in everything we do and say, in Jesus' name, to whom be glory forever. Amen.